Well, as we know, at the end of the month, international journalists covering the G8 and G20 summits are going to gather at a state-of-the-art media pavilion with a price tag of just under $2 million. And joining us now to make sense of it all is Nick Bont, is an award-winning professor from the DeGroote School of Business. Always nice to have you with us. So let's talk about that media pavilion. $2 million for that actual center, 60000 on a so-called fake lake. What is the cost-benefit of spending that kind of taxpayer dollars? Well, there's a lot of people who are cutting this move up by the government, but let's kind of talk about reality for a second. Toronto is going to have the world spotlight for three days and that's a very very important thing for investment in the city and investment back into Canada you know people complain about spending too much money on security and media we spent lots of money in Vancouver for the Olympics and look what happened went off without a hitch and that's what we're hoping for here in Toronto now to blow so much money for a fake lake I'm not so convinced that that was a great idea. They could have just gone, you know, 250 meters southbound towards Lake Ontario, put a bunch of Muskoka chairs there on the edge, and it would have had the same effect. But I was in Huntsville yesterday at a pre-G8 event. There's mm -hmm. a huge amount of security and a huge amount of media. Attention is going to be large. And what we've got to do as Canadians, Torontonians, and Ontarians is make sure that we put our best foot forward. It's the media that communicate and promote our city and our province and our country. We've got to make sure the media is comfortable. Speaking of the media, uh, Michael Ignatieff is calling this Lake Waste of Metaxa. And he says that France is poking fun at the lake. Uh, I'm wondering how the international media are reporting on us. Are, are they, in fact, laughing at us for spending this kind of money? Well, I think in the short term, there's probably going to be a little bit of a joke. But the reality is, in the long term, it's it's going to have a great impact. In that facility as well, there's going to be 150 restaurants, local restaurants in the area that are each going to have an opportunity to actually sell their wares, not sell, but actually distribute some of their food to all the dignitaries. And you know what? It's going to be great because of our ethnic background. So they're going to have a little taste of Canadianism, and I think that's a good thing. But they could have done that without a fake lake. I mean, yeah. you could make the argument either way, sell Canadian goods and, and sell our country without spending that kind of money. Yeah, I'm not so convinced about the $50,000. In fact, there was a joke. Ignatiev put a little swimming pool in his front yard a little plastic dinghy at 1995 that that's was the right $19.95 that. so at the end of the day I think we're just looking for news right now uh, you know the GA G20 is a few days away so they're just trying to make a bigger story out of it than I think it is all right speaking of big stories the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico it has been a big one we're at day 50 something mm -hmm. at this point uh, I think there the US government is now estimating that between 20 and 40 thousand barrels of oil is spilling into that area my question to you is, how has this not resulted in an increase uh, at the price of the pumps? This happens every time there's any kind of disaster, whether it's man-made or, or natural disaster, a hurricane comes through, the prices go up, and we haven't seen that. I'm not complaining. <laughs> That's a great question, Taz, and I'm sure all of you are also wondering, why has gas prices not gone up? Well, there's two reasons for this answer. Number one, even though it's a lot of oil that's spilling out, we see video images of it coming through the bottom of the sea, it's just a small drop in the proverbial bucket compared to the global oil that actually is coming out of refineries all over the world. So offshore refineries in the U.S. represents a small percentage, so it's really not affecting supply and demand. The second reason is this is a huge PR stumble. Mm -hmm. You could imagine how backlash it would be if all of a sudden gas prices went up because of a problem that the oil refinery company had. See, this is different than Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina is done by some power above. It is uncontrollable. This was actually controllable, some sort of corporate man-made problem. Mm -hmm. So there'd be huge PR backlash if they actually ended up increasing prices. So I guess the bottom line is we still have the same supply source. Um, what if it was a refinery that was hit? Would that be much different situation? Yeah, and in fact, we're entering hurricane season now in the Gulf of Mexico, and actually that's what the real danger is because there's a lot of large refineries out there. So if a hurricane actually stumbles upon two or three of some of these major refineries, mm -hmm. it actually impacts the supply much greater than the collapse that we have of this particular For now, uh, we'll stick with those lower prices. That's we'll right. take whatever we can get. Okay, also this week, a lot of hype about the iPhone right. 4, and we've got the older model right. there, which is pretty thin, but mm -hmm. the new one is even thinner, and it's got some, uh, some new gizmos and, and bells and whistles. Have you had a chance to look at the uh, the iPhone 4, and what do you think of it? Is it, is it worth upgrading or, or buying the new model? Well, let me talk a little bit about some of the features, because I had a couple of uh, my students actually go down to Buffalo and pick up the uh, i4 version. First thing that you're going to notice is that the actual display is fantastic. They've actually come up with a brand new high resolution display so that when you look at the iPhone one foot away from your retina, your retina assumes that it's high definition clarity. Wow. So high definition for a cell phone, we've come a long way. <laughs> the process
processing power is huge. It uses an A4 chip. Recall the iPad just came out, Taz. Yes. It's the same chip in the iPad, so very, very powerful. It also has what's called a two-axis gyroscope. The initial iPhone had a one-axis gyroscope, so if you turned it around, you could tell where it was going, like a compass. Mm -hmm. Now that actually becomes more refined, and that's going to be great for games and GPS and that sort of thing. And the final thing is the camera. It's now 5 meg. It used to be 3 meg. Plus, this thing can also substitute for a high-def video camera as well. So we got a lot of really cool features in the, uh, in the fourth generation version. Now, would I go out and buy it? I'm not so convinced. How much is it selling for? Well, upwards of three, four, five hundred bucks, depending on the model that you get. And yeah. this is the problem. People are very, very tired of having to upgrade their cell phones every one or two years. The good news is, though, the 3G models, I'm sure, will be dropping in price if That's they haven't right. already. That's right, and if you can survive without all the bells and whistles of the new version, it might be better off for you to pick up a 3G version off eBay. You'd probably be able to get one for maybe $70 or even $60 as soon as that new one gets launched. So if you're in the market for an iPhone, hold on time. for a few weeks. You might be able to get a cheap older generation. Good advice. Now, speaking of things that have been around for a long time, Ford Mercury, uh, Ford Motor rather, has announced that it is pulling the plug on uh, the Mercury, and that ends a 71-year-old tradition. Mm -hmm. And I'm told the Mercury, I haven't been around that long, once stood for innovation. You know what? We've got some clips of some of the commercials that Mercury has come out with over the years, and they are pretty impressive. This is a, an iconic, uh, just a little medley of some of the iconic commercials. Let's take a look. It's challenging. It's serene. Cougar. Mercury Cougar XR7. And I'm... I don't know what the tagline was in there. It had something to do with the Cougar, and that obviously was the uh, the Mercury uh, Coupe. And, and let's not forget James Dean. He drove a, a Mercury Coupe in uh, Rebel Without a Cause. Mm -hmm. Farrah Fawcett made even more famous by these commercials. Yeah. And then uh, coming up, we have uh, it's Jill Wagner more recently. So uh, this is a a huge thing for Ford to announce. A lot of people saw it coming, but this is the end of an era. What do you think was the reason for the demise of the Mercury? Yeah. Well, the interesting tidbit about the Mercury Cougar right there, they had Farrah Fawcett advertising yeah. it. You know, I don't know if the term Cougar was actually <laughs> meant that back in the day. She's but, too young yeah, back then. Yeah, she's too young back then. She's so, in the prime. You're right, Taz. The brand's been around since 1939, so this thing's got a huge legacy. But the problem with the Mercury brand was that it never actually had a vehicle that stood out. I mean, they had the Mercury Cougar, they had right. the Mercury Grand Marquis, but that was pretty much it. Mercury was actually positioned by Ford as an entry-level luxury brand. So right underneath Lincoln. Lincoln is Ford's luxury brand. Okay. And of course, the problem is that Lincoln went down market. All the entry-level cars go up market, and what happens in the middle? Mer Mercury gets squeezed out, and that's right. eventually what happened. Towards his last fiscal year, they only sold 90,000 units. You can't keep a brand alive for 90,000 units, so they're shutting it down. And just to put that into, into perspective, when, at the uh, height of the Mercury, they were selling, I think, 580,000. Right. So that's a huge drop. Yep. Well, uh, the question locally is, is this going to affect workers at the uh, the Oakville plant, the Ford Oakville yeah. plant? So the good news is that we will not be negatively affected in that the Oakville good. assembly plant. We might actually be positively affected. The Oakville assembly plant right now is making the Ford Edge, the Ford Flex, and the Lincoln midsize SUV. So with the Mercury disappearing, maybe some of those Mercury customers might go upscale to the Lincoln midsize SUV, which means Oakville assembly jobs are safe and secure. Let's hope. That would be nice if we position ourselves that way. Okay. One final question. Okay. Did you have a favorite Mercury commercial over the years? No, I, I didn't. I remember those Cougar I didn't. ones. I, I didn't. I mean, uh, obviously, Farrah Fawcett, I, I'll admit, I had a Farrah Fawcett poster <laughs> in my bedroom wall, but to see those old YouTube commercials, you know, brings back some memories. There are some good commercials. Yeah. All right, well, that is it for Bontis on Business this week. Be sure to check out his website, nickbontis.com. Nick, always a pleasure having you Thank with you, us. Thank you, Taz. Thank you so much.